Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Bangyay Baptist Church. Uh, this is our third Sunday of the month, and we praise and thank God for this uh, another opportunity to worship Him in, in, in spirit and, and in truth. Psalms 95 says, O come, let us worship and bow down, and let us kneel before the Lord our, our Maker. For our first song, we will sing, He is my strength. O Lord, O Lord God of my salvation, 
I cry out day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry. For my soul is full of troubles and my life draws near to show. I am counted among those who go down to the pit and I am a man who has no strength. Like one set loose among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, like those whom you remember no more, for they are cut off from your hand. You have put me in the depths of the pit, in the regions dark and deep. Your wrath lie heavy upon me, and you overwhelm me with all your waves, Selah. You have caused my companions to shun me, and you have made me a horror to them. I am shunned in so that I cannot escape, and my eyes grow dim through sorrow. Every day I call upon you, O Lord. I spread out my hands to you. Do you work wonders for the dead? Do the departed rise up to praise you? Selah. In your steadfast love de declared in the grave, or your faithfulness in Ab Abaddon, are your wonders known in the darkness, or your righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? But I, O Lord, cry to you. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. O Lord, why do you cast my soul away? And why do you hide your face from me? Afflicted and close to the death from my youth up, I suffer your terrors and I am helpless. Your wrath was swept over me, and your dreadful assaults destroyed me. They surrounded me like a flood all day long, and they closed in on me together. And you have caused my beloved and my friends to shun me. My companions have become darkness. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. For uh, our another song, we will sing, tell it to Jesus.
Pastor Jeff for our uh, announcements. Afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our uh, worship service for this afternoon. And uh, our first announcement, um, next Sunday will be our last Sunday for online worship. And it is our joy to invite our first senior pastor to bring to us the Word of God. So our speaker for next Sunday is Achan Imrad. So I hope that we will uh, uh, anticipate for that message uh, for next week. Our second announcement is we can continue to support the ministry and the work of our church here uh, through our giving. Um, we can send our offering physically or give our offering physically to our church treasurer, or you may transfer uh, our offerings online uh, through our bank account. Uh, the details are still the same. And number three, uh, as we have been announcing for a couple of Sundays now that uh, our church elders have been... Uh, planning and desiring and now we have decided that this year we will celebrate our uh, thanksgiving month and together with that our church anniversary so the date that we have uh, uh, chosen is july 5 2020 and thank god that will be the first sunday that we will come together and worship uh, physically here in our building so that will be the date for our first anniversary celebration but the second uh, thing that we decided is uh, which year we will celebrate as our church anniversary. Will it be the year 1996 that the work here in Bangay started or the year 2014 when our church officially became an independent church uh, with membership of Thai and uh, the Filipinos and together with that we begin to self-support and we begin to govern ourselves uh, after uh, deliberation uh, uh, talk and prayer our church elders four of us unanimously decided to pick the year 2014 to celebrate as our anniversary so it will be the sixth year anniversary this coming july uh, to celebrate our current identity and god's faithfulness to our church right now but of course uh, this church would never be here if it did not start in the year 1996 but we will just be celebrating our church independence as a self-supporting self-governing church of god here uh, unfortunately because of our current pandemic uh, that we have to be careful in our social gatherings uh, this will be a low-key uh, celebration we will not invite our friends because our space is limited and because of that, uh, we will have two services or two celebrations, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. Uh, in the morning is our Thai. Uh, the church elders and their families will come here and uh, celebrate uh, with our, our Thai brethren. And in the afternoon will be the Filipino celebration. It will be a potluck. We will bring our own food uh, to share and to celebrate in the afternoon. Just simple uh, food to bring uh, so that we just can... Uh, eat and uh, fellowship and gather around we'll some we will have some activities after uh, that will be our anniversary celebration on july 5 2020 so because we will prepare for our anniversary this week we will have no online bible study uh, please take note that this wednesday we will have no online bible study because of our anniversary celebration for our final announcement, we would like to greet a happy Father's Day to all the fathers. Uh, so if you are worshiping at home right now with your D groups, kindly look at your fathers uh, in your group and greet them. Uh, happy Father's Day. Uh, you beso beso them. And uh, we will end this announcement with a prayer for our fathers. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you that uh, we can call you as our Heavenly Father and uh, you have gifted us with earthly fathers who uh, loved us and cared for us since we were young and uh, right now with uh, the current uh, situation that we're facing you know the burdens in their hearts uh, the burden of leading our homes burden of feeding our homes the burden of the responsibility of having to lead of having to uh, work and uh, the stress of uh, the situation, the uncertainties, and uh, the adjustments that they have to make. I pray that you would uh, guide our fathers to be strong, uh, for them to find their strength in you, for them to continue to grow in you, and their joy and uh, their love from you, so that it would flow out 
uh, for their love, uh, for their wives, and uh, in leading and loving their children. I pray that you would bless our homes with uh, godly fathers, uh, loving fathers, and uh, fathers who would set an example uh, for each one to follow, worthy, a worthy example of what it is uh, to be a believer and a father that would glorify your name. We honor you and we praise you for this time that we can pray for them. This is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Happy Father's Day, everyone. Thank you so much for that uh, uh, announcement. And before we ponder or listen uh, in God's word for this afternoon, we have a privilege to listen to very special music.
For a study of Scripture this afternoon, shall we turn our Bibles to Psalm 88? We will uh, look at the whole chapter for this study. Uh, we will not read this because we have already read it during our Scripture reading time. Hopefully you uh, some sort of got a little glimpse of what the message of this psalm is about. Shall we commit this study to the Lord in prayer? Shall we pray? Father, we humble ourselves before you and before your holy word, asking that you would grant us the wisdom, the vision to see the truths behind your word, whatever it is that you want to teach us, uh, to tell us this afternoon. Pray that you would guide us through the power and the enabling work, transforming work of your spirit. Help us to see you and to know your purpose for our lives in this moment through your word. And may you be honored and be glorified. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. In late April, a 59-year-old woman by the name of Anya Khan was treated urgently at a hospital uh, in Bangkok, uh, our capital here in Thailand, after she, was, she swallowed rat poison in front of the finance ministry to protest a lack of financial aid. Anya Khan was desperate and saw no hope of authorities listening to her pleas after she was denied the 5,000 baht aid during one of the most difficult weeks of her life due to the COVID-19 pandemic. She was denied 5,000 baht aid for three months. 5,000 is just about 150 US dollars. Ironically, the aid payments were called by the Thai government as the Rao Mai Tinkan program or no one left behind. But apparently, she felt that she was left behind. She had been yelling uh, at the front, uh, at, the en at the entrance of the, the Ministry of Finance. She was yelling, nobody cares about me. And after being ignored again, she swallowed a few pills of poison, rat poison, and fell to the ground. After she was hospitalized, she was visited by representatives of the cabinet who promised to transfer the money as soon as they can. Now, her attempted suicide is a part of a worrying trend here in Thailand as the economic distress caused by the coronavirus is leading more and more Thais into despair. Now, I know everyone in the church is aware that I'm on a suicide watch here in Thailand. I don't keep track of everything, but I'm keeping an eye on it. I heard the news about this uh, lady, but this article from The Diplomat by Anna Salva tells her story in her article entitled The Coronavirus and Suicides. She wrote this on May 11, uh, the, just this year, and her headline reads, Scholars warn that the number of people dr driven to suicide by economic hardship could exceed the number of COVID-19 deaths if the government doesn't react. Now, the local media have published very sad cases in, in the following weeks after her death, such as the story of Irada, a mother of two children from Mahasarakam, a province in the northeast of our country, who hanged herself on April 21 after having problems supporting her two young children. She generally made a living selling yogurt from a small cart. She was already in a difficult situation even before the movement restrictions imposed to stop the spread of the virus left without her clients. A day, after, uh, a day before Irada's death, a 41-year-old father took his life. His five-year-old daughter also died. Their bodies were found by police floating in the Pasak River in Ayutthaya, north of Bangkok. Residents told police that the father had been unemployed and could not find a job to earn an income. And a witness said, he heard the father jump into the water first, and his crying daughter followed next. Thailand is well known for having one of the highest wealth inequalities in the world and one of the highest suicide rates in Southeast Asia. In fact, suicide ranks second among the non-natural causes of death in this country after traffic accidents and is more common than homicide according to the government. That's astounding. In a study by the World Health Organization based, based on two, the 2016 data uh, listed Thailand as having the 32nd highest annual suicide rate in the country with 14 people uh, killing themselves for every 100,000 population per year. Uh, Thailand is the highest in the Southeast Asia for suicide. 
and the COVID-19 pandemic and the accompanying economic devastation has only worsened the situation. That's why experts would say if the government will not do anything to alleviate the economic fallout, more people would die by suicide than the pandemic itself. But I think one of the greater blows to our Filipino community here in Thailand is when a certain Filipino just a few weeks ago, I know everyone heard and knew the news, and some of you know him by person, by the name of a teacher, a Filipino teacher by the name of Melvin Cacho. He hanged himself in his apartment. I have been thinking and praying about preaching on the topic of depression and suicide long before Melvin's case, but his death some kind of confirmed to me that we have to talk about this. Now, I would say Filipinos are the most resilient people who went through pain of oppression, calamities from foreign occupation, natural disasters, and corrupt governments. Even through those situations, we, were, we Filipinos are the most resilient of people. We can cry through our problem. We can smile through disasters. We can sing through oppression. Even through corrupt governments, we can make fun of corrupt presidents. This is why I think we rank 166 at the suicide rate. If Thailand has a rate of 14 people killing themselves for 100,000 people, we are at just three people for every 100,000 people. However, because we live here in Thailand, a society with a higher suicide rate, more or less, we will be affected by how they feel and how they think about life. And people we know may also be affected. Just go out in the streets. I don't know if you feel it, but I can feel it. Business are down. People are down. Morale is down. It will not be the same. But I want to tell you, yes, we will talk about depression and suicide with this message. But I will give you a disclaimer. I will make it clear that I'm not an expert on depression or helping people with suicidal thoughts, nor will our passage today answer everything there is to know about depression and suicidal thoughts. But I do what I do want to accomplish today with our study of Scripture is that it would help us deal with our dark and heavy emotions, deep and lingering pain, whether those emotions or pain are caused by sickness or injury, calamity, or any other problems, whether it's emotional, social, or psychological problems, I hope that what we will study today will help us deal somehow with those emotions. Because our question for this study um, is this. We have two Number one, how can true believers deal with deep and overwhelming emotions in their darkest and toughest times? When we go through darkest and toughest times and we, f we have these deep and overwhelming emotions, what will we do with them? Feelings of depression and misery that could lead us, even lead us to entertain thoughts of taking our own lives. What will we do with those feelings? The first question is to, ha, has to do with us. But the second question I want also to think of others. If it will not happen to me, how can we believe or help others who are dealing with deep emotional burdens? Because if it's not you, it may be your family member. It could be your parents. It could be your siblings. It could be your children. It could be your friend. It could be a neighbor, it could be a colleague, it could be your student or someone you know, someone dear to you who is thinking right now, I am so burdened with these emotions that I cannot deal with it, might as well just take my life. So I just pray that this message, hopefully, we will not come to this point, that we will have deep depression or it will not happen to the, to the people we know. But if it will, 
we will somehow find wisdom and direction from God, that we have a psalm that we can run to, that we have a prayer that we can run to, we have this song that we can run to, that would help us navigate, help us what to do in those situations, that we can just navigate through them, find help and way out that God can give us. So Psalm 88 is an individual lament. Now there are um, songs or this most likely is a prayer. There are prayers of lament or a prayer in pain uh, that can be a corporate lament, a cry of a people, but this is an individual lament suited for a person who is so overwhelmed with troubles that affected him physically, emotionally, socially, but above all, spiritually. Now it may be noticed that the psalmist does not specify the troubles like other psalms would do. Uh, other psalms of lament would notify us that uh, he is being oppressed by an enemy, but this psalm, there's no clear direction, uh, there is no clear uh, identification to it the most that the psalmist said in this song is that he is afflicted since he was young most likely by a disease or an injury but these troubles to him feel like expression of God's relentless wrath but the, the more general way of being overburdened with little specifics because it, it is more of a general way of expressing his burden it allows the psalm to be used by us is it allows the psalm to be used by any faithful believer as we face a wide variety of hardships that will overburden us. Now, most laments let in a ray of sunshine or it will usually close in a confident note. Yes, Lord, I am suffering, but at the end of it, there is hope, there is confidence. I will trust in you because you will answer me. But Psalm 88 is different from all the rest in that there's no explicit statement of confidence. That's why this psalm is called by commentators as the darkest psalm in the Bible. It has been called one of the saddest psalms in the Psalter. That's why if you noticed, uh, we have been, our scripture reading for every Sunday has been the book of Psalms for a long while now. But as I look back, uh, I was about to use Psalm 88 for a scripture reading today. I was referring back to my files. And surprisingly, but not surprisingly, I skipped through Psalm 87 and 88. Because Psalm 87 is a song about celebrating Jerusalem. And we're not people of Jerusalem. We're the people of the new Jerusalem. Uh, it's not a psalm, some sort of a worship psalm, but Psalm 88 is a very depressing psalm. It's a dark, sad psalm all throughout because it voices the diligent prayer of one who suffered constantly. And the psalmist lamented his terrible and fierce affliction that had brought him to the point of death. This psalm is a mournful and desponding in character. The author is a sufferer. He's expecting to die. He fears to die. He longs to live. And his mind is overwhelmed with gloom, which to him, he doesn't seem to be given any one ray of hope or comfort. Yet he steadfastly prayed to the Lord through them. So, Psalm 88 is in our Bibles to tell us that the faith of this psalm cannot be separated from the faith expressed in the rest of the book of Psalms. And it helps us when we sing it, we pray it, to see that faith can be real even when it cannot arrive at strong hope after prayer. If you do not feel confident, if you do not feel that you're trusting the Lord at the end of it, Psalm 88 is one of your examples you still feel down, it's okay. It's still a real faith, even though it's so small. And those without such problems, with, with such problems may pray this psalm on behalf of those suffering. So as we look at our Bibles, look at Psalm 88, uh, we'll explore the title uh, quickly. The title or the superscription over Psalm 88 says, a song, a psalm of the sons 
of Korah. This is not a Psalm of David. Who are these sons of Korah? These are descendants of Levi through Kohath. And they were gatekeepers and musicians in the temple. The sons of Korah composed about 12 songs in the Psalms. And uh, the specific writer here is named Heman, the Ezraite. Heman is believed to be a musician from this family of the sons of Korah or Kohath. And he may be the same person who was one of the wise men during the reign of Solomon. So, uh, after identifying the writer, he says here, according to Mahalath Lianoth. Now, these two words, the first word, the word Mahalath, it means it's either the name of a tune or an instrument. If it's an instrument, it's possibly a reed pipe which was played on sad occasions. And lianoth may mean to afflict and describes the despair which permeates this psalm. Some commentators believe that if you combine these two words, mahalath lianoth, it means a song concerning afflictive sickness or a sad melody, a mournful melody for uh, composed for the occasion of sickness, when you are sick, when you're injured, when you're afflicted. And the purpose would be to express feelings, experience in sickness or affliction. But if you combine these two words together, Mahalath Lianoth, this is a very sad song with very sad words played on a sad tune. A sad song with sad words on a sad tune. But again, Filipinos are a resilient people acquainted with grief. We have kundimans. Our kundimans are played mostly on minor keys, if not all of them in minor keys. Because the tone of the minor keys, it will express pain, bitterness, painful experiences, and the grief we have gone through as a people and as an individual. That's why with our condemnments, we have coped with pain and suffering as a people, even with our songs. So I could say, I could just say, Psalm 88 is our biblical condemn. So we turn back to our question, how can true believers deal with deep and overwhelming emotions in their darkest and toughest times? And how can we help others who are dealing with with the same deep emotional burdens. Look at verse 1 to 2. The psalmist opens the song by declaring his purpose there. He says in verse 1, O Lord, O God of my salvation, I cry out day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry. Let my prayer come before you. The psalm is a petition. He makes an earnest prayer to God. He calls out to God, Lord, God of my salvation, I cry out. How often? Day and night before you. His prayer, His constantly before God. He's signifying to God that there's no intermission to His prayers. He prayed all the while. And one commentator noticed that this prayer does not refer to the general habit of His life, but to the time of His sickness. He had prayed most earnestly and constantly in times of his sickness that he might be delivered from it and from the dangers of death. He had as yet obtained no answer, and yet he now pours out and records a, an earnest petition to God. He tells God, let my prayer come before you in verse 2, as if something which hindered it or which had obstructed the way to the throne of grace as if God repelled it from him and turned away his ear and would not hear. He's asking God, Lord, let my prayer come to you. Kung sa ilunggo pa, ginuo palab utaman ang pangamuyo ko sa imo. He makes not only an earnest prayer, he also makes a painful and urgent prayer. He cries out to God, Hear my cry. He's doing this in great pain and great distress. And he tells God in verse 2b, To my cry, incline your ear. Give me your ear. Because we incline our ear to anyone we wish to hear of what he or she is saying. But we turn away our ear if we do not want to listen to them. 
So he is praying to God, Lord, be attentive. Listen to me. He calls God, O oh Lord. That's the Hebrew word, Yahweh, the personal God of Israel. He is calling on him to hear him. And he describes this God, the God of my salvation. Martin Luther renders this, O oh God, my Savior, on whom he depends for salvation and who alone can save him. So the psalmist in verses 1 and 2 is praying to God earnestly, urgently, painfully. But why is he crying out to God for deliverance earnestly, urgently, and painfully? Verse 3 to 9 would, or 3 to 8, would describe his great trouble. Verse 3, 4, because... It signals a clear reason for crying out to God in pain, persistency, and urgency. What is he going through that made him cry out to God in pain? It tells us in verse 3, For my soul is full of troubles, and my life draws near to sho Sheol. My life is full of trouble. Now, the, the word rendered full means properly to satiate, or you are filled with food. When as much had been taken as could be. So he's saying here that his tr this trouble was as great as he could bear. He could sustain it no more. He had reached the utmost point of endurance. He had no power to bear anymore. I am filled with troubles. And one commentator notices that this next section, verse 3 to 8, would describe the troubles in general terms, focusing more on the feelings than on the external circumstances. He feels overwhelmed by his troubles. His emotions are overwhelming him because of his trouble. And number two, look at verse 2b, and my life draw nears, draws near to Sheol. Now from verses 2 to 7, the psalmist here will use many words or ideas to describe death or place of the dead. That's the uh, common theme here in verses 2 to 7 and all throughout the rest of this psalm. And Sheol is the first word he used to describe death or the place of the dead because it may be a poetical name for the grave or the place of the dead. In other words, he's saying, I'm about to die. And unless I found relief from God, I must go down to the place of the dead. Verse 4, he tells us here, I am counted as among those who go down to the pit. Now, the word pit here is another word he used for the grave or for death. He is so near to death that he may be counted or considered already. I am counted, considered as one among the dead. It is so clear to others that he seems to be dying and that his, his trouble or disease is killing him. That they already speak of him as dead. They count him as one who is certainly dying. Verse 4b says, I am a man who has no strength. I have no power to resist this disease. I have no vitality left within me. I am dying. Verse 5a, like one set loose among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave. Like when slain in battle and set loose there is uh, the word... Uh, rendered in other versions free like one who is free among the dead ginbuy an sa mga minatay now um, interestingly job said death is freedom and he derived comfort from the idea that death is freedom uh, job 3:19 says the small and the great are there in the grave in in death and it's good because he says if I die the slave is free from his master and I will be free set free from my pain but it seems that the psalmist here does not admit this idea into his mind rather than taking sorry the small and the great are there and the slave is free from his master rather than taking comfort in this thought He feels depressed because he doesn't want to die. And verse 5c, he tells us here, like those whom you remember no more, for they are cut off from your hand. 
It expresses the idea, idea that death cuts off all ties from family and friends and most of all to God. As if I will die, I feel like I will be cut off from you. As if I were forgotten by you. As if I'm no longer the object of your care. I'm, I suffer to lie and waste away with no care on your part, God, to restore me to life and to preserve me from dying. So in verses 3 to 5, the psalmist feels that he is dying, losing strength, and f- like he is forsaken in the grave. Take note of the words he used, like. It may not be reality, but he is comparing himself to that. Verse 6 to 7 gets interesting because he says, You have put me in the depths of the pit, in the regions dark and deep. Your wrath lies heavy upon me, and you overwhelm me with your waves. Now, notice the shift from the first person perspective, I, my, from verses 1 to 4, and the comparison of verses 5, to the second person, you. Starting from verse 6, he seems to address God directly, or wala na paligoy-ligoy. Then in this direct address, Heman declared that God had brought this trouble upon him. You have put me in the depths of the pit, in the lowest pit. Dark and deep regions. The pit of the deep, it's dark. All these expressions are designed to express the idea that he was near the grave, that there was no hope for him, that he must die. You have put me there as if the grave, the place of the dead, have become already his dwelling place. This whole scene, starting from verse 3 to 6, is a sad scene, overwhelming with grief. And the only prospect he's seeing here is a continued sorrow and gloom. And even a believer may be made afraid of this state. The prospect of dying because of sickness, it can make the mind, us of us believers, sad, sorrowful, because death is naturally gloomy. And when the light of God's truth does not shine upon our soul, and if His comforts do not fill our hearts, it is but natural that our mind should be filled with gloom. Verse 7a, he says, Your wrath lies heavy upon me. Your anger presses me down. It burdens me. What pressed hard on him and crushed him to the earth? whether he's suffering bodily or mentally, now he suspects that what is happening to him is God's anger upon him. He's interpreting that this bodily or mental sufferings that he's experiencing in the sad and gloomy state of his mind are evidences of God's displeasure against him. You overwhelm me with all your waves. Now, this is a striking image of God's anger. Like angry and unceasing waves that keep on beating the shore that God has directed upon him. It seems like, God, you're angry with me and you do not stop in beating me like waves. You're overwhelming me with your anger. It made him felt overwhelmed by the expressions of what he suspects as God's anger in allowing him to go through these afflictions. So the idea here in verses 3 to 7, it feels like he is dying, and worse than that, he is dying under God's wrath with no hope, either now or ever. Now there is a sense that pain comes directly from God when there is no relief from Him. We feel that, Lord, you're punishing me if you're not listening to me, because I'm reaching out to you in prayer. Our first lesson here from verses 1 to 7 is this. When we don't receive immediate relief from God, we feel as if, we feel, it may not be reality, we feel as if He is forsaking us or putting out His anger at us for something wrong we did. God's silence makes us suspect that He is angry at us or He is neglecting us. 
The inaction of God does not make us think He is unable to help. God is able and we know that. But because He does not move, it makes us think that we did something wrong for Him to allow it to happen to us. Because Job felt this. He tried to figure, Lord, what's my, what did I do wrong? And his friends was trying to tell him, to prove to him, Look, Job, you must have done something wrong for God to do this to you. But one commentator said, and I like this, he said, this psalm, Psalm 88, allows the singer to lay out these des despairing feelings. It does not tell us, however, that such feelings correspond to reality. Yes, he is encouraging us. Okay, express your feeling to the Lord, even though it's not the, the truth. Just express, just lay out those feelings. So it may or may not be true that God is punishing him for any wrongdoing that he is feeling, but only that he feels that way. Okay, express it, but it may not be the reality. So indeed, anyone genuinely singing this type of songs and prayer to the Lord, however miserable he may feel, can be assured that he is still expressing true faith. Okay, pour it out. Pour it on. Even though it's not reality, it's okay. I will let you express those feelings. These despairing feelings produce genuine pain. It's a real pain and God wants to acknowledge our pain whether or not they correspond to reality because when we don't receive immediate relief from God we feel as if it may not be true but we feel that as if he is forsaking us or pouring out his anger at us for something wrong that he did that we did verse 8 and 9 he continues that theme, you, God, have caused, what? My companions to shun me. You have made me a horror to them. I am shut in so that I cannot escape. My eyes grow dim through sorrow. I am shut in, verse 8c. The pain keeps on building. He feels shut in as if he is in prison. Most likely because of his disease, he is confined to his house. He cannot escape. He cannot leave his bed, his room, his house. Some see this as a quarantine experience. Most likely, maybe he had leprosy. That's why he is shut in. He is removed from his friends. As if, Lord, you have turned away my friends against me, people who should have comforted me, but they cannot come near me because I'm dangerous. I could contact, contract my disease to them. So my eyes has wasted away. He's collapsing under his distress. He keeps on crying that he has no more tears to cry. It is harder to bear. Oh, it's good that if you're sick, someone goes there to visit you. But if not, the burden gets greater. That's why one of the most painful things that a prisoner can feel if wala nang, wala nang dalaw, there's no one visiting them. And he feels that God is shutting him away socially from his friends and from his family. And yet, in verse 9b, he ends this by saying, Every day I call upon you, O Lord, I spread out my hands to you. He's overwhelmed with trouble and pain, feels like dying, socially isolated, suspecting that God is allowing all this because God is angry with him for something wrong he may have done. And yet, every day I call upon you, O Lord. Tough faith will not let go. He remains to be tough in holding on to God. Every day he calls upon God. He prays earnestly and long, even though he does not receive an answer. Oh Lord, I spread out my hands to you. I am in the attitude of prayer. I bring to you earnest supplication. I do not let go of you, God. Now, verse 9 is a device in Jewish literature called inclusion. 
in that he started his paragraph, this per first paragraph in verse 1 with a prayer, he ends this paragraph or this thought with a prayer. So through pain, he prays. Through isolation, he prays. Though suspecting that God is angry with him, and yet he reaches out to God. And the members of God's congregation singing this will learn to keep coming to the Lord. By this example, we can learn that even though we feel this way, God is inviting us to reach out to Him, to spread out our hands to Him. Verse 10 to 13. Do, your, do you work wonders for the dead? Do the departed rise up to praise you? Is your steadfast love declared in the grave or your faithfulness in Abaddon? Are your wonders known in darkness or your righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? The mention of dying under God's wrath in verses 3 to 7 leads to the question in verse 10, do you work wonders for the dead? Now the purpose of this question is not to deny that the Old Testament has a hope for the afterlife, but rather it allows worshipers who feel the pain of verses 3 to 9 to continue expressing their fears. It does not deny that there's no hope after death in the Old Testament, but it encourages the, the saints to express what they feel. Do you work wonders for the dead, he asked. He reminds God through a series of rhetorical questions about God's character, of God's work, in comparison, if, I'm die, if I die, what will happen to your goodness? The dead cannot testify to your goodness, God. The idea here is that the dead will be cut off from all the privileges which are given to the, to the living here on earth. And that those in the grave, if I die, I cannot contemplate on your character and your greatness. That's why he takes this as a reason why God should rescue him. He's using this as a reason. Lord, if I die, I cannot praise you anymore. Verse 10b, do the departed rise up to praise you? Now the question has no reference to the future resurrection, but it relates to the dark, dismal, gloomy, inactive state of the dead from which he understands. Lord, if I die, how will I praise you? Because he thinks that the place of the dead is dark and deep. It's your steadfast love declared in the grave, your goodness, your mercy. Shall anyone make it known there? Shall it be celebrated there? Now, the New Testament would tell us that there will be no preaching of the gospel in the place of the dead. That's why when the rich man asked Father Abraham in Luke 16, can you send Lazarus to my brothers? There's no preaching the gospel in the place of the dead. So if one were to die under God's wrath, then he could not anticipate any experience of God's wonders or any chance to praise Him in Abaddon, the place of destruction. So the person who is singing this obviously does not want to perish in this way. Lord, I do not want to die under your wrath. And the last phrase he describes here in 12b, or your righteousness in the land of forgetfulness. He calls the place of the dead the land of forgetfulness, a description illustrating the ideas. What they think about that time, at that time about the state of the dead. That when you're dead, you're you're forgotten. You can see nothing because it's dark. Memory would fail and recollection of former things pass from the mind. Now, so as the psalmist stated that he continued, he reasoned that a dead person cannot praise God's works and attributes in the grave. I want you to understand that Heman wrote all of this from a human physical perspective, but it does not contradict other verses in the Bible, whether it's the Old Testament or the New, that speaks of conscious existence after death. 
God is giving us a glimpse of a human perspective. If you are miserable, if you are dying, it's okay to express that the grave is dark and I cannot praise you there. So he is using this reason that the Lord should deliver him so that he could declare God's glory. Because true believers want to praise the Lord. And to Heman, death seemed to be the end of that opportunity to praise God. That's why verse 13, he tells us, But I, O Lord, cry to you. The prayer goes on, echoing the previous theme of earnest and urgent prayer. O Lord, I cry to you. In the morning, but that is each morning, every day, my first business in the morning, even though I'm sick, even though I'm miserable, when I wake up, I pray to you. My prayer comes before you. So for the third time, the psalmist affirmed his faith by his cry to God for help. But the final section here in verses 14 to 18 repeats the previous themes, only express it in the greatest degree. I call this outline the great trouble, the great and dark trouble, the greater and darker trouble. And my third outline here is the greatest and the darkest trouble. Because he starts verse 14 by saying, O Lord, why do you cast my soul away? Why do you hide your face from me? Why is it that you do not help? Since you have all the power and since you are a God of mercy, why do you not deliver me from my troubles? Why do you, why do you cast my soul away? How often God's people are forced to ask this question, and how often these questions express what we feel in our, in our hearts and what we think in our minds. And how difficult too it is to answer the question and to see why that God who has all the power and who is infinitely benevolent does not move to deliver His people in their affliction. Now the answer to this question, why cannot be fully given in this world, there will be an answer furnished doubtless in the future life. Why do you hide your face from me? If God would lift up his face upon us, it will show us his favor. But it seems that he is hiding his favor from me. You are not answering my prayer. And there's no indication here that his persistent, urgent, and painful prayer will be answered soon. Lord, you seem to be unwilling to look upon me, the sufferer. You're permitting me to bear my sorrows, unpitied and alone. Verse 15, afflicted and close to death from my youth up. From my youth up, I'm already afflicted and dying. He's saying that for a long time, for so long, my whole life has been a life of trouble and sorrow and have no strength to bear it longer or anymore. I am helpless. Now, the, Greek, uh, the Hebrew word for the word helpless here is translated perplexed or distracted. That's why the King James... Um, translated this, I am distracted rather than helpless. Because when we are sick, when we are afflicted, we cannot compose and control our minds. We cannot reason calmly. We cannot think straight. We do not want to understand God or His ways. We are distracted with conflicting feelings with our pain with doubts with fears we cannot think clearly of anything when we are in pain when we are sick that's why our lesson here in verses 14 to 15 is this do not wait until you're helpless before you will prepare for your afterlife 
Do not wait until you're helpless, distracted, you cannot think straight before you will prepare for your afterlife. Now, Albert Barnes suggested what we need to prepare us for sickness is a strong faith built on a solid foundation while we are in health. Such an intelligent and firm faith that when the hour of sickness shall come, we shall have nothing else to do but to believe and to take comfort of believing. So Albert Barnes is suggesting do not wait until you're helpless before you will prepare for your afterlife while you are strong. Have a strong faith, have a firm faith, so that when you are weak, you can still hold on to that faith. Because he goes on to further say, the bed of sickness is not the proper place to examine the evidences of religion. It is not the place to make preparation for death, not the proper place to become religious. Religion demands the best vigor of the intellect and the calmest state of the heart. And this great subject should be settled in our minds before we are sick before we are laid on the bed of death. Yes, it's not too late to turn to the Lord when you are dying, but do it while you can. Do it while you're not helpless. Do it while you cannot think straight. Do not wait until you get distracted, unable to make things right with God. So, if you are not yet prepared, make things right with God right now while you are strong, while you're not sick. Verse 17, we're nearing the end. They surround me like a flood all day long. They close, on, close in on me together. The description of his pain is building up to a climax. Here he describes that his troubles did not come in a single way so that he could meet them one at a time. They seem to have banded themselves together and they all came up to him at once and all the time kung sa ilunggo pa dugin dumugan ko sang problema sang kasakit sang kapait gindumugan ko nila ginoo that's why he ends finally verse 18 uh, with this you have caused my beloved and my friend to shun me this echoes verse 8 that, Lord, you have caused my friends or companions uh, to shun me or to forsake me. Then, the last phrase of verse 18, my companions have become darkness. Now, while some manuscripts renders this last phrase, darkness has become my only friend. My, co my friends are forsaking me. They cannot come near me. My only friend left is darkness. Perhaps verse 18 might be translated, Far away from me have you put lover and friend, my acquaintances. All is darkness. You have put my friends and family away from me, and what I'm left with is darkness. This completes the picture of the suffering man, a man to whom all was dark, and who could not find no consolation anywhere. He could not find comfort in God, in his friends, in the grave, in the prospect of the future. Now this psalm is telling us that there are such cases, and it was well that it was good that there is one description in the Bible of a believer suffering this way. Psalm 88 shows us that when we feel this, it should not be regarded as proof that we have no true faith in God. Because beneath all this, beneath all this pain, all this bitterness, all this madness, all this affliction, there may be true love to God. Beyond all this, there may be a bright world to which the sufferer will come and where he will forever dwell. Now this lament, as we have said, is unusual because it does not end on a happy note. Romans 8, we ended it on a happily ever after. Psalm 88 is the complete opposite of that. Psalm 88 is like a Korea novella I used to watch when it first became a hit when I was in college. Everyone was watching it. I tried to watch it, but I realized 
Why are, are, are these movies so dark? They kill the leading lady or the leading man at the end. When she is sick, she does not get well. She just dies. And the story is just so dark. What, are, what, are, what kind of people are you? Psalm 88 is this kind of movie. It's a very sad ending to a movie. There's no happy ending. But this word darkness, this somber word darkness, is the last word in this psalm and yet even this does not mean that the ultimate outcome will be totally dark we will return to our question so that we can end this study so how can we true believers deal with deep and overwhelming emotions in their darkest and toughest times and how can we help others going through deep emotional burdens? Our application for Psalm 88 is this. In our toughest and darkest times, we believers should honestly express our overwhelming burdens to God in persistent prayer. God is calling us, come to me, pour out to me, cry out to me in your pain, in your misery, in your affliction, come on, honestly express what you feel because you have an example here in Psalm 88. Come to me, but come to me in persistent prayer and lay hold of me through, our, through your relationship with me, the unchanging God and your only Savior. Most lament in the Psalms would let in a ray of sunshine or a ray of hope. They usually close with a confident note. But Psalm 88, there's no explicit statement of confidence. But while there's no explicit statement of confidence found here, there is an implied confidence in that he confessed that God has brought him these troubles. So if you have sovereignly brought me these troubles, I would trust that you would also bring relief. I cry day and night before you, O Lord, God of my salvation. He prayed unceasingly, persistently, even through pain. Even though he is not answered, It did not stop him to come to God constantly and unceasingly until he finds God's answer or response. This psalm instills a tough faith in its singers by reminding us to keep turning to God even during these times when it seems that there's no answer being given. Tough faith through toughest times. Even though if God will not answer you, pray, lay hold of Him. And though He does not understand God's ways, He still turned to God, which indicates an underlying trust. Because the faithful know that there's no alternative but to keep seeking the Lord in prayer. Now Psalm 88, like Job in some ways, the psalmist suffered what appeared to be God's wrath. Job was also separated from his friends and loved ones and was almost in despair. Yet knowing that God was his only source of hope, he continued to reach out to God. Now take note. Three times he tells us he prays. And every time he prays, look at if you notice it. Oh Lord, I cry out day and night to you. Verse 9, every day I call upon you, oh Lord. Verse 13, but I, oh Lord, cry to you. He calls every God, every time he prays, he calls God Yahweh. So while the psalmist suspects that God is doing this to him out of anger for sin in his life, yet he is still fond of calling God Lord, Yahweh, the personal God of Israel, who has a personal relationship with his people, the psalmist is still holding on to his personal relationship 
with Yahweh, the unchangeable God. Lord, even though I'm in pain, I will still call out to you because you are unchangeable. Yes, you may be silent now, but I know you are unchangeable. You are faithful. He calls out to God, Yahweh, and God of my salvation in verse 1. Without answer, without relief, yet he still reaches out to God, whom he acknowledges as his only Savior. Now, it's not a surprise that Jesus is the exact combination of these two words in verse 1. O Lord God of salvation. Jesus is the name Yahweh is salvation. That's why the book of Hebrews can tell us Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not love money because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You can trust Him. You can reach out to Him. But the one question that I kept asking myself as I was studying this and listening to this prolonged cry of this saint, I was asking, is there any point in this Psalm 88 that Teman thought of taking or ending his own life? Yes, he suspects that God is doing this. He's separated from his friends. He's overwhelmed with burden, but he's about to die. He fears dying, but he has the will to live. He wants to live. He did not think even a bit of ending his life, which tells me suicide in the darkest psalm is not the answer. So while a true believer can think of suicide, while a true believer can commit suicide, this darkest psalm is calling us to hold on tight to God. Now there are recorded suicides in the Bible, such as the suicide of Saul and other Israelite kings to save face in the battle, because in that culture, in their culture, you would rather die in honor in battle than being shamed at the hand of your enemies. But whenever they fall upon their sword, literally, the Bible gives no comment about them, whether it's, it's a good thing or a bad thing they did. But there's this one case of suicide, the guy by the name of Samson, he died in a suicide mission. He took down the pillar of a building to kill 5,000 Philistines together with him. Judas Iscariot hanged himself, most likely because of guilt. He cannot escape the feeling of remorse and guilt, so he hanged himself. But my question is, can the most faithful saints have suicidal thoughts? Can the most faithful saints have suicidal thoughts? And the answer is, yes, they can. Moses, overwhelmed with the pressure of leading God's people with all their complaint, asked God this. He tells God, Lord, I'm not able to carry all these people alone. The burden is too heavy for me. Many of us don't like our presidents or our leaders as if you think being a leader of a, a nation, especially ang reklamador ng nasyon, you think it's easy? Moses asked God, if you treat me like this, if you allow me to go on like this, if I find favor in your sight, Lord, just kill me at once. I cannot bear this. He thought about ending his life, but he asked this of God. Elijah, he was frustrated why the evil queen Jezebel still want to kill him. After he experienced victory on Mount Carmel over the prophets of Baal, Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah telling him, I will kill you as you killed the prophets of Baal on that mount. So verse 3 in 1 Kings 19, he was afraid. He arose and ran for his life. He came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. Verse 4, but he himself went on a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. Some would think a juniper tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life. I would rather die because he was overwhelmed by the burden of the ministry of serving God and being faithful to God. 
and yet being hunted down anyway. So Lord, might as well take me. So the fo most faithful among the saints, among believers, can undergo depression and think suicidal thoughts. Now, while studying for this sermon, I have read a bit about depression and these articles would say there are involuntary feelings of depression due to chemical imbalance in our hormones. It may happen because people who experience deep problems, trauma, postpartum after you give birth or other things. The chemical imbalance in our body causes our hormones to make us feel depressed, feel down. Think of bad thoughts, suicidal thoughts. But also just, I think, last week, I also read something shared by our young people in our, in our previous church that it is a choice. Some psychologists would say if your chemical imbalance work in you, you do not choose that. But this article says it's a choice to stay in depression. The post said something like this. When people feel unacceptable, they become frustrated and anxious, which makes them experience guilt. So they need punishment and volunteer to punish themselves by choosing depression. He enumerates, I think, the six steps to depression. So it starts with feeling. Feel, then they become, then it becomes their experience. Because they fail, they need punishment, so they would rather volunteer punishment upon themselves. And lastly, from just feeling, it comes to the will. They choose depression. From feeling that it's not may, that may not be the reality, but it end up being a reality because of their choice. So I like what one commentator said about what happened with Haman in this psalm. He said, the deep pain he felt may not be what the reality is. It may be a real pain, but the reality is that God may have not punished him for any sin. But because he felt that way, he felt down. He has a choice to stay there or to come out of there. But thank God that the Bible does not give us an ending, a good ending to it, so that... He can encourage us to express our deep feelings to Him. And yet we should not choose to stay there. So what are we going to do with these feelings when it happens to us or to others we know? I like what Albert Barnes said. He said, as the book of Psalms was designed to be useful in all ages and to all classes of people, and as such state of mind as that described in this psalm might occur again and often, it was proper that such a condition of utter despondency we find in this psalm, even in a good man, even in a godly man, even in a true believer like Eman, acquire, uh, possibly acquired director, should be described. His pain, his utter despondency is described in order that others might see that such feelings are not necessarily inconsistent with true religion and do not prove that even such a sufferer is not a child of God. I would hear that I think there is a stigma within our group that if you have depression, buangka, you're abnormal. You have no Christ in your life. No, you can feel depressed because the Bible has a one long psalm for it. But you do not have to choose to stay there. That's why he continues to say, it is probable that this psalm was designed to il illustrate what may occur when disease or affliction is such as to produce deep mental darkness and sorrow. And the book of Psalms would have been incomplete for the use of the church if there had not been at least one such psalm in the collection. God is acknowledging our feelings, our emotions, our pain, that even though it may not be the reality, Albert Barnes is telling us God has a reason for allowing this psalm to be a part of our Bible. He wants to tell us that it's not wrong or sinful 
for the most faithful of believers to go through this deep, dark, and painful feelings, only that we don't choose to linger in them without choosing to reach out to God, to snap out of our alternate reality into the truth that God is Yahweh and our Savior. Yes, you can feel depressed, but choose not to stay there. Choose to be like Heman, that even though he's depressed, he is constantly, incessantly, unceasingly, painfully, urgently crying out, reaching out to God. Peter did not sell Jesus, but he betrayed him nonetheless. He was also in deep sorrow and remorse, but Peter chose to return to Christ. He did not choose to wallow in, that, in those emotions. If Judas Iscariot had returned to Jesus the way Peter did in repentance and help, do you think Jesus, Yahweh, the Savior, would turn him away? Now this psalmist expressed his deep pain and overwhelming burden but he was conscious of laying hold of his personal relationship with Yahweh, whom he knows is an unchangeable and faithful God. He chose to call on his only Savior. Do not choose to be there should we go through moments like this. And if someone you know feels like this, be a sympathetic friend. If they have thoughts of suicide or in deep depression, empathize, try to listen. They would never snap out of that if they do not come to know Christ to save them, to give them life, meaning to their lives, or a hope to live for. Now, there was a young man in India. He came from the highest caste of the Indian caste system, the Brahmin priest family. At the age of 17, this young Indian man in India was under the pressure to perform well in school but he wasn't doing well at all seeing his other siblings succeed but he is not he looks at himself as a failure and a disappointment now what we would should understand about the society of India is that they are an honor shame society they failure puts a lot of pressure upon them especially on young kids so suicide becomes a way of escape the sh of shame to them, especially after the announcement of exam results. So this young 17-year-old man one day took out chemicals from his school lab. He went home and drank it all down. Fortunately, he survived. At the hospital, being ashamed, he, he realized, I do not know how to live. Now I also failed to even to die. He was grasping, searching for meaning in his life. A minister of the gospel visited him in his hospital room, wanted to share to him the Bible, but his mother did not allow it because by that time this young kid was still unstable. But, then the, but in God's providence, the minister left him that small red New Testament Bible and opened it to John 14. When he was a little bit better in his hospital bed, his mother read to him, John 14, when God took hold of his heart, he heard and grasped on to these words. John 14, 19, where Jesus said, because I live, you also will live. This young man said, Jesus, if you can give me this life, I will take hold of this life and follow you. This young man who tried to kill himself was Ravi. His life could have ended 57 years ago, but God used his life-giving word, his hope-giving son, who could give purpose, meaning, and a reason to live for this man who for 57 years followed God and represented him in his gospel passionately and faithfully. When Christ took hold of him, Ravi did not choose to dwell in misery, in the failure, in the desire to die. He chose to receive the life that Christ is offering, that Christ is giving. 
He chose to dwell in the realm of truth, not the alternate reality that our depressed emotions could make us. So right now, if you're feeling down, if you're feeling that no one understands you, that you're shut out from the world, and you f if you're thinking deep, suicidal thoughts, take hold of this. Jesus has said, because He lives, you will also live. Find life, find meaning, find purpose and hope in God. And oh, brother and sister, you will never know. You might be used by God to bring a Bible to someone who is thinking of suicide, to share a gospel, to lead someone to hope, to life, to meaning and purpose in Christ as you reach out. Listen to them, be a friend, empathize, sympathize, and lead them to God. I will end with this quote. Harold St. Beale said, When life caves in, broken and shattered souls need more than human kindness. They need God himself. Be a friend to those who are broken, shattered, and about to take their life, but lead them to the one they truly need. Yes, be kind, be a friend, but lead them to God himself. Because in Psalm 88, we learned in our toughest and darkest times, we believers should honestly express our overwhelming burdens to God in persistent prayer and lay hold of our relationship with our unchanging God and only Savior. Shall we pray? Father, we come to you. We may ask why, but we may not receive the best answer. Why would you allow affliction, depression, feelings of pain and darkness to come into our hearts, to make us feel this down? But Father, I thank you that in the same manner even though we experience this, and yet in reality, you have offered life because you have died on the cross. We may f be afraid to die, but your son experienced death on the cross. He experienced what it is to be in the place of the dead, to be in the realm of darkness, Father. Thank you that because he lives, we can live also. So right now I pray for those who are watching this, studying with us, and have entertained these thoughts or have these feelings in their hearts, I pray that they would reach out to you in prayer and lay hold of their relationship with you. Their Savior and their God. And I pray, dear Lord, if they don't have a relationship with you yet, that they would come to you in repentance. Come and receive life that Christ is offering. Come and receive hope, purpose, and meaning in him. I urge you, dear brother or sister, come to Christ and find life and purpose and hope in him. We thank you for your word. This is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. We will going to sing our song of the month entitled He Will Hold Me Fast. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
pray. Father, we thank you that this afternoon we can worship you and we thank you for your word that even in our darkest moments, Lord, you are there. You're calling us to cry, up, cry to you and uh, trust you and look to you for hope, for strength, for purpose, for life, and for meaning. I pray that your word would strengthen us, it would guide us um, even through those moments or even you would lead us to opportunities to help people who are battling with emotions that are overwhelming them, of thinking of taking their own life. I pray that you would lead our lives uh, to help those people uh, go through it and overcome it as well. Lord, we thank you that we can honor you through the songs and uh, through the fellowship. I pray that uh, you would continue to help us as we go back to our work uh, this week. Lord. It is our joy that uh, you are always there uh, to guide us, to enable us. I pray that you would uh, help us, that we would bear fruit, uh, the fruit of the Spirit for your glory and for your honor. With the love of God the Father and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us. Amen. Hey. 